But you know when somebody is in their element, yes. and every time you come to one of Charisma's um, events, you could tell this is exactly where she belongs and what she's supposed to be doing. So I appreciate that. I also appreciate she builds all these like word whiskers up in her introductions. And then she knows she's never gonna get through without the glasses. And then she never has the glasses. So, um, so I always, I always enjoy that part. So, I um she, she kind of alluded to the fact that I don't think my story is very special at all. Um, by a show of hands, just so I know who I'm talking to, how many of us in the room are thinking about becoming an entrepreneur or are at the very beginning of their entrepreneur journey? Okay, we have a few, don't be shy. How many people are like maybe just a few years in, you think you're starting to kind of get some wind in your sails? How many people are blowing it out of the water? They're just freaking, they're killing it. They've made all, all the financial marks have been hit. Okay, so we're all, the room is filled with all different parts of the journey, right? But out of everybody in this room, how many people are exactly where they are aiming to be already? How many people are still looking to hit that next goal. Probably every one of us, right? So no matter how far you are on the journey, there's always, you hit a goal and then you set your eyes onto the next goal. And that's kind of what entrepreneurship is about. One last um, raise of the hands here. How many people knew that they were gonna be an entrepreneur, this is what they wanted to do? How many people just kind of fell ass backwards into it? Maybe a situation happens, okay? So the title of my talk is Entrepreneur of Choice or Circumstance, okay? And the underlying theme that you're gonna realize and what I'll probably say a thousand times is, if I could do it, you could do it. Because I really do not feel like I am a special case. I am not somebody who has had my own business for 10 years and has made a million dollars. I've never made a million dollars. I don't know what that's like. Maybe Randy will tell me one day what that's like. but. <laughs> I'm, I'm on the journey just like many of you. I've only had my business for a few short years and I'll kind of talk about a little bit of, of how I fell into it, right? I'm, a, I'm an entrepreneur of circumstance. But the, the people who are entrepreneurs of choice, you know, they kind of always had that driving spirit. They always knew that they didn't want to answer to somebody else. They knew that they wanted to be their own boss. They knew that they wanted to kind of set the rules of the game for themselves. And I was not that person, right? And I'll talk a little bit about my backstory. Um, I kind of fell kind of into this a little bit. So I've done every, probably like a lot of you, I've done every job that there is, right? Everything from uh, having like a paper route when I was a kid, um, stocking shelves at a supermarket, working at a bowling alley, uh, may even have sold some drugs back in my day. Now that may have been the only time where I had that entrepreneur spirit where I thought, I'm gonna figure this out, I'm gonna do it my way. I, I didn't graduate school because of it, so I don't recommend it, all right? Um, I wound up getting kicked out of high school for it two months before graduation. So uh, I did get my GED, so I did finish, but an unfortunate, unfortunate set of choices or a poor set of choices created that circumstance for me, right? So that's kind of like where the, the journey begins. Um, you know, I come from what you would say is a broken home. I had, a, I had great parents, but divorce at a young age. So I think for a lot of us, you know, what we go through as children, as young adults, traumas on different levels, right? Your trauma is different from my level of trauma. The worst thing that you've ever experienced in your life is the worst thing that you've ever experienced. But pair that up against somebody else's experience, it might seem completely minuscule, but we're all living our own experiences, right? So the things that happen to us as we're children and young adults, the choices that we make, the choices that our parents make, the choices that our, the people that we surround ourselves make really do define who we become as we do become adults, right? And it's up to us that when we become adults and we're able to start thinking for ourselves and looking back and trying to figure out what these things are is to really identify them, but then to be very reflective. You know, how do these things affect me? And a lot of times it takes the help of a professional therapist, which is something I recommend. Find the right one, because not all therapists are created equal, but you find somebody who will help you kind of unroot some of those 
things that may have happened in your past that, that define who you are today, but they don't have to define you forever, right? So when you can identify them and you can reflect on how these things may have affected you, you could start working on kind of categorizing them and figuring out how they won't define you for the rest of your life, right? So just to say that we all go through our traumas, my backstory is mine, yours is yours, right? You know, um, had a lot of things in my, in my younger life. I had a pretty good young life, middle class life, so I'm not going to harp too much on, you know, was living on the streets and stuff like that. It wasn't that bad, but, you know, could it have been better? Sure, but it, it was pretty good for us as kids, and uh, I appreciate my parents and, and what they did. And, and, you know, you can only work with the tools that you have. So they helped create who I am today, the good, the bad, and the ugly, but I like to focus on the good parts that they helped create for me. Um, going back to a little bit about, like, um, becoming an entrepreneur. So I was always the guy who was just punching a clock for somebody else, right? Except for those times where I was just chasing a music dream. I believe it or not, I used to rap and, uh, we're not going to get into it. I'm happy she didn't hand me the microphone cause I'll start having like little flashbacks and start, start getting into it. But, um, you know, punching the clock, you know, working dead end jobs, never really leading anywhere never really having a purpose. Now, there's a lot of women in the room and women need purpose as well, but the men in the room know this and they feel it in their hearts that when a man does not have a purpose, it gets real rough for him, right? So men need to have a strong purpose as providers for their families, as husbands, as fathers. I'm, I'm a husband, I'm a father, I'm a brother, um, I'm a son. It's very, very important for me now in my later years, I'm 40 years old, not later years, but as I'm older, 40 years old, that I define what my purpose is. For so long, I had no purpose. I was chasing a, a music dream, but really what that was, was avoiding responsibility for myself and just kind of partying and living kind of like a, a sinful life. Now I'm still a sinner, but I, and we all are, but... <laughs> But I was living in ignorance of my sin, and, and when you do that, you, it compounds, right? So the smoking weed led to maybe doing a little cocaine, led to heavy drug, uh, alcohol abuse, led to promiscu uh, promiscuity, thank you very much, uh, being a philanderer of sorts, right, before I met my wife, of course. And all of these things compounded, just created a, a dead end, a, another dead end in my life that eventually something happens, hopefully for us, where a pivot gets created and we start redefining who we are, right? And I knew, and I'll, I'm going to get into next how that happened for me, but um, a lot of times what we have to do is hit our rock bottom before we realize the path that we're on is not the path that we're intended to be on. And if you believe in God, the, the, the path that God intended you to be on, right? So, um, for from 2009 and then for the next 13 years, I worked in the pharmaceutical industry. I hung up my mute, my hip hop hat, right? My flat brim hat and my 5X t-shirt. And I, um, I grew up in the 90s. So like, you know what I'm saying? Like that was real hip hop. Um, and I just went to work because my, my son who's in the back there, Michael Jr. He was born in, ow! Oh, he was born in, uh, 2014 and I realized that I needed to start providing and and start becoming an adult start becoming a man and and be responsible for somebody else so I kind of fell backwards into the pharmaceutical industry but I did that I was very good at it and I did it for 13 years I worked right down the road here at Santa Fe Pastor and um, I started as a temp worker probably making nine dollars an hour um and they went on a hiring freeze. If they wouldn't have, I would have gotten hired full time pretty quickly. But they went on a hiring freeze for five years. So I had to work as a temp for five years. Now, I could have went and did something else. But I started making much better money fairly quickly. Within like a year or two, I was making $20 an hour. And in 2011, that was still pretty good with inflation. Now, that's like not very good at all. But um, with that being said, I was punching the clock. I was answering to these people, I was, it's a, you know, a multinational company, a global company. And when you work in a, in a industry of that nature, especially that pharmaceutical 
FDA regulated, a lot of bureaucracy, a lot of, you know, inner politics, a lot of global politics that go involved there. Um, it was it was a very interesting place to work, not somewhere where I ever thought I would end up, but I produced vaccines for over, you know, over a decade for 13 years. I really believed in what we were doing. I enjoyed most of the people that I worked with, some of the people I don't really miss. Um, and I enjoyed the type of work that I was doing, and I knew that I wanted to do a really, really good job. At that point, it dawned on me that I could no longer be the guy who just kind of like coasted if I wanted to get something greater, right? So I knew that I had to be the one who showed up first, left late, did the job that nobody wanted to do, which is what I did on day one. I said, what's the thing that nobody ever wants to do? They don't want to wash the buckets. There's a hundred buckets. They don't want to wash the buckets. I said, I'm going to do that every single day until you make somebody else do it. And I did it for probably a year straight. And that just kind of set me up to be noticed by the right people. And then I got promoted and then I got hired full time. And then I went from making $9 an hour. By the time I left there, I was making $40 an hour as a manager associate scientist, which sounds super fancy. Um, and I guess it kind of is, but essentially I was in an engineering role when I finally left there in 2022. And um, I, w I did not choose to leave there necessarily. I was kind of forced out of my position. So I think we all know in 2020 when COVID kind of got unleashed onto us, things got a little, a little strange, right? Um, a lot of people were forced to stay home. They couldn't work. Well, I was fortunate enough to where I was working somewhere where this was our bread and butter, man. They said, world ending pandemic, you're working 80 hours a week. You know, you're not, you're not going home. You need to be here for this. So, um, I was fortunate enough to be able to work through that. And I went to work every single day in 2020 halfway through 2021, then I got promoted to a different position, which was salary, partially remote position. And I was able to be in the office when I wanted to and, and home when I wanted to. The unique position that I was in when COVID hit was I was working in this industry for over a decade. I understood, I was working with the experts and I'll put it in quotes now in hindsight, the experts on this topic. So it, it, became very strange to me. Let's put it in contrast before I go into it. If I was working at, let's say, McDonald's and nothing wrong with working at McDonald's, if my superiors didn't know anything about natural immunity, antibodies, vaccine efficacy, I wouldn't have thought twice about it. I would have said, why would you know about it? You're just the manager here at the Burger King, right? Or the McDonald's. But I worked with the expert. And as COVID progressed and then the vaccine started being developed and rolled out, our, my coworkers, myself included, at all levels in the, in the company had a lot of questions. How are we producing this so fast? What's the efficacy? What about natural immunity? What about antibody? If I just had COVID, do I still have to get the shot? And they started requiring the shot in order to keep your employment. Now, for you, if you thought that that was the right choice for you, I commend you for making the choice. It was a gun to the head decision for a lot of us. If you decided the opposite way that maybe it wasn't the right choice for you had just gotten COVID or something like that and you weren't comfortable with it, that's your choice as well. I'm a libertarian, so I truly believe that you do what's best for you and your family as long as you're not hurting anybody else. I have nothing to say about it. When we started asking questions, though, they started censoring our questions. I'll give you an example. We have these all-hand meetings, 2,500 people in the meeting. At that point, they were doing them over Zoom, right? They didn't want to do them in person. And they would tell you about how the year went and what our prospects were for the next year and how great that was going to be. And they would finish, and we would always do a Q&A session. And at the end of this, uh, this one in, I want to say, maybe it was a mid-year meeting, the mid of 2021, or towards the end of 2021, actually, this one was, we had a lot of extra time. They were very excited to take all the questions. People started asking questions about, the compliance with their vaccine policy that was going to be rolled out in January 22. And all of a sudden, the Zoom feed ended. They had no time for questions anymore. So you could, uh, you could uh, see how if you were already a little skeptical or you had questions, you know, maybe you, were, you wanted to make a decision that was going to be right for you and everybody, but you wanted to ask your expert superiors um, so some specific questions, but you were being censored, you were being blocked from asking those questions, 
Now all of a sudden some red flags going up, right? So for a lot of people, uh, they decided that I don't feel comfortable with this. I'm not going to comply with this policy. Long story short about, I don't know what the exact number is, but several hundred people got terminated from the job and I was one of them. Okay. Um, I don't tell you this story for you to start thinking and searching in your head about, oh, this guy thinks he's right about vaccines and COVID and the way things got handled. That's not the point of me telling the story. The point of me telling the story is I never wanted to necessarily run my own business. I was perfectly fine punching the clock for this company. I was making pretty good money. I had great benefits. And at the time that I got fired, my wife was a full-time nursing student at the time, and my son was eight years old. I was the only one making an income, and I was the one carrying the benefits. So it would have been far easier for me to just comply and not ask any questions, right? So again, the choice that I decided to make for myself, not the choice that I told anybody else that they should make, but very important that I think that we have the conversation. COVID is one very stark example of a time in our history when we should have had more conversation and we had less conversation. If you had questions about it, you were some sort of tinfoil hat wearing conspiracy theorists. This happens a lot in society and with politics specifically. These last, let's call it eight to 12 years in politics in our country has been extremely divisive, okay? It probably goes back way further than that, but this is my you know, I'm kind of young, right? I'm middle, I don't want to, young, middle-aged, whatever. Um, some people in the room will say I'm young. Some people will say I'm old. Some people will be right in line with me. But I think it's important for us to be able to have the conversations because through the conversations, through the asking the questions, and through answering those questions with our heart, not with some sort of preconceived notion or uh, determination based on our political party or our race or our gender that we have open discussions with each other and that we be grounded enough to understand that we might be wrong about our position and we should be open to maybe being wrong to our position, right? And this happens a lot. This happens with race relations in our country. This happens with the gender ideology discussions happening in our country right now. This happens with the politics with uh, schooling, I mean, across the board, this happens. And the one thing that has been missing is a genuine discussion amongst people. I'm not talking about the talking head on CNN or Fox telling us information or the politician that we may have voted for or didn't vote for, but now is in that position to kind of speak for us, dictate to us what the information is, for us as people to have the conversation and to be open to changing our positions. I would say, don't be so married to your opinion or your, the position that you hold now, because in a week, a month, a year, that could be a completely different position that you hold. So not to get like too sidetracked off my story, but I think that's an important way to like kind of end this part of my, my story, right? Losing my job was based on a decision that I felt I had to make for me. In hindsight, I do feel like I made the best choice for me. And here's why. When I was losing my job, I knew it was coming in the end of 2021. We didn't think they were going to go through with it, but they wound up going through with it. So January 22, it started becoming very real. I started falling into a very deep depression, a lot of anxiety. Um, I was smoking so much freaking weed. I'd probably, everybody in here would be pretty impressed. Uh, I was smoking five, six blunts a day by myself in the garage and uh, not good, not, not a good way to live your life. Um, and I thought I was helping myself cope, but really I was numbing myself from what had to happen, which was I needed to start planning for whatever the next thing was, whether it was gonna go punch a clock for somebody else or I was gonna figure something out on my own. Um, I was seeing a therapist. I started seeing the therapist when I was still working at Santa Fe because I went on short term at the end. I couldn't even focus at work. I was so worried about losing my job and providing for my family. I started seeing a therapist so I can go on short term. And the therapist that I was seeing was falling asleep in our sessions. I was telling my story and I'd look across the room and he's over there snoring and he'd wake up and he'd, 
Ben, how did that make you feel? I'm like, <laughs> well, how, do, how does this make me feel, you know? Um, I, need a, I need to grab my water, I think. Um, <clears throat> so again, not all therapists are created equal. If you're gonna go find a therapist, I actually definitely suggest that most people do, but make sure you find somebody who is a good fit for you. And is probably gonna stay awake in your, uh, in your sessions, right? The other thing that uh, happened to me was I, um, I was living a very spiritually uh, absent life uh, for 38 years. I was very agnostic. My mother's side of the family is Jewish. My father's side is Irish Catholic. And we were never raised to follow one religion or the other. Went to a synagogue a couple times, went to a church a couple times, but nothing consistent, nothing really with intent, right? My older brother, Brian, who's not here, my younger brother, Jerry's here, our older brother, Brian, went through about 13 years of hardcore drug addiction, in and out of prison, living in the woods, breaking and entering, um, getting hit by a plow truck because of his addiction problems. Like all sorts of poor decisions just compounded and led to the life he was living. And when he was in and out of jail and prison and rehabs, he tried every religion there was. He tried Christianity at first, then he converted to Islam, then he went tried a little bit of Judaism again, and then found a Christian program, Teen Challenge, that he wound up in at the end, and it was just the right set of people at the right time for him. He was finally able to receive the message of Christ, and he changed his life. Five years ago, even, you would see my brother. You would, you would, you'd lock your doors, right? You see my brother today. He's an amazing, amazing man. Um, and, a, and a great example for me, um, in my journey with Christ, I, I found Christ through this whole process. So the silver lining in me losing my job, going through depression, medicating myself, medicating myself, um, and just avoiding making the decision to start planning for the next thing, I found myself, uh, my brother Brian started sending me sermons. Well, check this out, you know, so I'm washing the dishes. And now I'm, I'm home. I'm, I don't really have a job. I'm washing the dishes and I'm listening to this sermon and I'm weeping. And I'm like, what the hell is this about, you know? And then my brother gets married. I might need some tissues. My brother, my brother gets married and he had somebody film his wedding, but he wanted me to edit it. So I'm editing his, his wedding film and I was the best man. So I gave a speech and my brother gave a speech and his wife said something, and then I'm, and the music is just right. And if you're editing video, you got to watch the thing over and over and over and over, making little adjustments. And I'm sitting in my studio, and I'm weeping, and I'm crying, and I'm, and I'm hearing the music and the words. And a little crack had formed in the shell that had built up over 38 years. And that was God just going. A little, a little light came through, just a little light at that time. And I called my brother up and I said, I think I want to come down. He lives in, in uh, Jersey. I said, I think I want to come down and I think I want to come to church with you. And I have not been to church at that point since I was probably a kid with my grandmother. Um, and again, no intent behind it, just going there, right? And my uh, experience that day at his church was when it all changed. So... No, 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 no. I'm not going to cry. There's cameras. I'm not going to cry. Um, leading, get this man a tissue. Leading up to that uh, point, again, I'm doing the dishes and I'm weeping and I'm editing and I'm weeping. And it realized, I realized that it was the layers that I had formed living that lifestyle that I lived for so long um, that were starting to peel peel off, right? And this is what God does for you, especially if you were not born with this, right? Where you were raised with these, with this life and having got God in your heart. So I went to Brian's church and uh, it was, as soon as the music started playing, I started crying. I knew it was over. I knew it was over, right? And then at the end, his pastor says, you know, um, they're playing like the, the worship music at the end of the service. And, you know, we're going to have some people over here. We're going to have a couple people over here. Um, and they are going to be uh, here. If you need somebody to pray with you, you can come up and, and pray. And I knew I had to go up there and pray, right? 
And, uh, but I went to go get up and there was a lady up there and she looked like she needed the prayers, right? I mean, she was going through it. And I waited and I waited and I waited and then, and then my brother's kind of in the back and I'm like, all right, I guess, I guess it's not time. I'll, I'm going to leave. So I go walk to the back and uh, I'm like, all right, I guess let's get out of here. And then some lady comes along and, and grabs my brother. Brian, come here. I want to talk to you real quick. And, uh, and it's kind of funny because it's a lady he's told me about several times and he says it re reminds uh, him of our mother. And she starts talking to him and I go, you know what? Let me just take a peek and let me see. And I look up and the lady's starting to walk away. And I'm like, it's now or never. So I go up there and I can't even get the words out of my mouth before I just start crying. My marriage is falling apart. I feel like I'm, I feel, I feel like I'm failing as a father and a husband, as a man. I don't have a job. I don't know what I'm going to do. And they start praying over me. Now, how many people have seen those YouTube videos at the church and the Holy Ghost hits you and they're rolling around the aisle and all, and I'm like, I'm like, these people are crazy, man. There's no freaking way. So the pastor's wife, and I didn't know it was the pastor's wife at that time, uh, this woman, Jen, and another guy, Chris, are praying over me, right? And Chris is praying, and she's affirming, yes, yes, Lord, please watch over Michael. And it's going, and then all of a sudden, I, I feel the warmth hit my head. Yes, yes, yes. And then my knees start doing this. And then I remember the YouTube video I saw with a lady rolling around the and I said, I am not going to become a YouTube video. But with all joking aside, it, I realized what these people were feeling, right? It was the Holy Spirit. And, and it was at that point where things changed for me. Now, I'm not here to preach Christ on anybody. It sounds like we have a lot of Christ-loving individuals here in the room, and, and I appreciate that. But... It was the thing for me that changed everything, everything. And I kind of already knew that I was applying for these other pharmaceutical jobs and nothing was working out. I have a very good resume, not a single interview. I was applying at companies where they didn't have any COVID policies. It shouldn't have been a problem. No interviews, not one, not a phone call to say maybe. I started applying for video editing jobs. A couple interviews, nothing worked out. And I realized it was God telling me, hey, man, I closed this door for you. Why are you trying to pry it back open? You're over there with a crowbar trying to pry this door back open. And I sealed it shut for a reason. It is time for you to move on. I think I hit my two-minute warning here, but we'll pay for extra time. We'll pay for extra time. Okay. Um, well, thank you. I, I appreciate that. We're taking the church. Okay, pass the mic is uh, here in the front. Um, but I realized what it was, and it was God telling me that I have opened another door for you, right? And it's a funny thing how God works that I realize now that I never would have realized before was he will run you right up to a brick wall. And right before you hit it, stop you. Door opens up, and then you walk through that door. Now, you have to be aware, and you have to make the decision to walk through the door, right? Having faith is an interesting thing that I'm learning is you don't have faith and then everything just comes to you, right? You still have to show up. You still have to make the decision to make the choice to do the right thing. It's like being an entrepreneur. Just because you have a website, just because you've made an LLC, just because you have a business card, just because you say I am a business owner now doesn't mean that it's just going to work. You have to show up and you have to take the steps. And this is something that I'm learning, right? It says, I'm very young in my entrepreneurial journey here. I started my business in 2020 on my mother's birthday, February 21st. She's a Pisces. Yay! She's a Pisces. I don't know if anybody knows, but charisma is an Aries. Oh, you're an Aries. Oh, an Aquarius. That's right. And if you know, I'm so, I don't know how I forgot. Yeah, because every time you talk to her, she'll let you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She'll let you. I'm sorry. We got the Aries right here, man. Um, so I started my business in 
2020, but I was still working at Sanofi and I was just doing it on the weekend. I was literally just trying to learn how to use a camera again because I had stopped for so long. I have a mentor of mine, Peter Mackey, owns Mackey Photo and Video. He has a studio on Main Street in Strasburg. And our kids were going to karate together. They're the same age. And a couple weeks turned into a couple months where I'm like, hey, man, I'm thinking about picking up a camera again, man, maybe doing something. He's like, dude, you've been saying that shit for six months. He goes, my best advice is to just do it. Just do it. So I said, you know what? You're right. So I wor- I shot a wedding for him yesterday. I love working with this guy. He's be- become one of my greatest friends. He's a mentor to me. He's a great businessman. He's a great father. He's a great husband. He is a great mentor and somebody in my life that has been a great positive uh, driving force for me. And I think we all need somebody or some people like that in our lives. It was already said before that, you know, you're kind of a sum of the five people that you hang out with, right? So you hang out with a bunch of losers and deadbeats and quitters, you're going to become a quitter, a loser, a deadbeat. Hang out with a bunch of millionaires and see how likely it is you become a millionaire. Now, hopefully you become a millionaire if that's the goal. But um, but yeah, so I, I took his advice. I, I picked up the camera. I started doing it. But I was still doing it on the weekend, and I wasn't really taking it that serious because I was making money at, at my job. And then I lose my job. It gets taken out from underneath my feet. And I, I realized after not being able to get other jobs in that realm, not being able to get video editing jobs, I realized that I I was not meant to go work for somebody else. I was meant to figure this out on my own. And it's not for everybody, and it is extremely difficult. I have months where I am crushing it. This past month, I killed it. The month before, I didn't do shit. (laughs) And it was scary. And then you start going like, what the hell did I do? Like, what's going on here? But progress isn't a a line straight up, right? Progress is like up and it's down a little bit and it's up and it's down. But over time, you wind up to where you want to be. But it's important that we realize that we have to show up, right? We have to take the steps. Every single day, everybody should have a power list here. And I think you kind of touched on this. There's non-negotiables that you should be doing every day to progress yourself in your business, right? So whether it's a personal journey or a business journey, You should have a power list of five things that you know that you're going to do, and you do those things every single day. And not every single day is going to be a grand slam, but every single day you'll hit a base hit, and eventually you'll bring somebody home. So if you're doing these things every single day, then you have a a far greater uh, likely outcome of success, whatever success looks like for you. So um, we have to show up, and we have to take the steps necessary. What else I will say that changed for me, God and finding that relationship was the number one thing for me personally. I had to get right spiritually before I can get right any way else. The other thing that I had to do was get right physically, okay? And this is going to resonate with my man right here. I looked at myself in the mirror uh, every day, but it really, I saw myself at the end of September of this past year. And I was absolutely disgusted with who I saw. My body, I did not like. No wonder why my wife doesn't want to lay with me and lay next to me. How the hell could she like me when I don't even like myself, right? What I was putting into my mouth, the food I was eating. Alyssa talked about this. I was just willy-nilly eating anything I freaking wanted without tracking anything, without figuring. Everybody here thinks they eat, I eat pretty healthy. I don't eat a lot of fast food. Okay, that's like not true. Um, But even if you don't eat any fast food, I eat pretty healthy. How much are you eating? How much are you consuming? How much protein are you having? How much carbs are you having? How much fats are you having? The bare minimum is being able to go, here's where I want to be. Here's where I am. Here's where I want to be and understanding what it's going to take to get there. And that journey is different for everybody. Some people want to put some weight on. Some people want to, most people like me, wanted to lose weight wanted to maybe build some muscle, lose some fat. But really what I wanted was to feel right because I felt groggy. I felt exhausted. I have, my back is killing me. My knee is killing me. My wrist is hurting. Like everything was hurting me. And I called my friend George who 
very recently transitioned from audiovisual work into being a full-time fitness and nutrition tra trainer. And I was basically just complaining to him, like just randomly called him. He lives down in Miami. I've known him uh, since 2006. We talked like every few months, but he's one of these people. You know, when you meet somebody, you know, this person is going to be in my life forever. George was my Cuban brother from another mother. You know, he was my compadre from another madre. He, he, uh, I knew. And when I called him, he said the same thing that p basically what Peter Mackey told me was, first of all, just do it, but also let me help you. Right. So I don't want to just like tell my story without giving some some things that maybe we could all take away from it. But this was another very important aspect of my journey, which is still ongoing, but I would never tuck my shirt in six months ago. Are you kidding me? I'd tuck my shirt in and be like, oh no, never mind. That's, uh, I don't feel very comfortable with that. Who stands here before you today is still a work in progress, but I lost 25 pounds since October, at the end of October. I, uh, oh, is that, Sugar lips? <laughs> now she's trying really hard to stop my, uh, my weight loss progress here. If I go to her house, she'll feed the heck out of me. Um, but I started George, with George's help realizing I can't do this on my own. I just don't know enough. I don't have the time to figure this out. You don't have to be the expert in every single thing in your life that you're trying to fix. Find somebody who is the expert, is passionate about this one thing, and lean on them. Pay them. If they have a service, pay them their service. Don't nickel and dime them. How, I know we've been friends for so long. Can maybe you just give me like a, uh, maybe I'll get you a lot of exposure. I hear this a lot. Mike, you're so expensive, but I can give you exposure. I can put you in front of a lot of people. How about you put me in front of a lot of people and then I'll give you some credits back or something like that. Like, let's figure out a way to do this where it's equitable for everybody involved. So I leaned on George um, to help me with my nutrition, my fitness, lost a ton of weight. Um, I'm just like, became a savage compared to who I was previously working out twice a day. Like this is kind of the extreme case, but it's what I had to do to get to where I am today. And I finally look in the mirror and I'm like, <laughs> yo, I'm now I'm asking myself, what did the bottom abs look like? And I've never even seen the top ones before. And and now my wife is looking at me like, hey, yo, like, don't be going out there with, with that shirt tucked in. What the hell's wrong with you, man? So, I'll wrap, you, you need me to, we need to get kicked out of this room real quick? All right, so I'm going to wrap it up real quick with just a couple key takeaways, which have already been said by everybody else, basically. Um, and I do want to say that hopefully by me sharing my story, again, if I could do it, you could do it. I'm nobody special. I am like at the beginning, a lot of you are further in your business journeys than I am and know a lot more than I do. I've seen more success than I have seen, but we are all facing obstacles. So it's about hitting an obstacle, identifying the obstacle, and then planning to overcome the obstacle, whether it's something you could do yourself or leaning on somebody else, an expert like George, a mentor like Peter for me. So, uh, First takeaway is get comfortable being uncomfortable, right? Living in our comfort zone does not help us grow. We live in our comfort zone and we exist. And that's it. We never go anywhere above just existing baseline. So you need to get comfortable being uncomfortable. If that is a business, you know, using like a business example, a lot of us hate doing sales, myself included, picking up the phone, doing cold calls, sending out messages, following up with people who may be interested, warm leads. If you don't do that part of your business, you don't have a business, right? So you have to do sales. If that's the uncomfortable thing for you, get really comfortable doing sales, being uncomfortable. Personal uh, example is a fitness journey. Let's say you want to lose a bunch of weight. You want to change your body. You want to feel better, but working out is so hard. I'd rather just eat a bunch of potato chips on the couch, so would I. Get up at 4 o'clock, 5 o'clock in the morning. Work out before the kids get up, before the wife gets up, the husband gets up. Get it done. And then now you have the rest of your day to run your business, to be a mother, to be a father, to be a husband, a spouse, whatever it is. So you have to challenge yourself and you have to be comfortable being uncomfortable. So we level up when we challenge ourselves, so you always have to challenge yourself and then seek help where needed, right? So 
everybody in here as a business owner, whatever phase of the journey you're on, there's somebody who's a little bit further than you. You should have a mentor that is a little bit further than you. Somebody who could teach you something, right? Some, somebody who could help you refine your, uh, your tactics, your business plan, your, just your overall mental state, right? Um, and so you, everybody should have a, a mentor. The other thing that I did was I found a coach. I found a video business coach, okay? Now, I know guys that went through this program that thought it was a complete scam. I went through the program, made $50,000. So I'm like, how the hell was it a complete scam? If I made $50,000, you made $5. That don't make no damn sense. So when you find a coach, first of all, find the right coach. Find somebody like Charisma Leadership Page that can lead you down the right path and who is actually interested in your success, right? Not just selling you a program and then never seeing that success. Um, but when you find a coach, they are not going to run your business for you. You need to do the work. So why did I make $50,000 but the other guy made $5? Because I wanted it to work. I wanted it to work and, I, and it had to work because I had a mortgage to pay and I had no job. So uh, it had to work. Um, the other thing would be for me personally, and it sounds like for a lot of you is, uh, having some sort of spiritual guidance, right? So whether that's Christ, whether that's something else, whether it's just, I'm a spiritual butterfly, whether it's, I just like taking ayahuasca every few months and going on a journey, which I'm not saying that I haven't done that either. And it has been helpful, but it's not for everybody. Um, Find something that's going to work for you to help you have a bigger purpose, right? A greater purpose is what this all comes down to for everybody. And then the last thing I will say as a takeaway, which has already been said, is do not wear all the hats in your business. This is something that I'm struggling with. I want to do it all. And as a creative business, it's very hard for me to go, here, you edit this project that I work so hard on that I have a vision for, and then hope it's going to come out the way that I envision it. But there's only so much time in the day. And for me, my business, the most time consuming part is the editing part. So if I could start outsourcing that, having trust in somebody, training them, and then training and trusting, right? We already heard, then I can maximize my time, right? I can be in more places. I could be in multiple places at one time, right? So everybody say hello to Chris over here. I have him filming for me. He's at the... He's at the beginning of his uh, video business journey as well, and he's, he's learning, and, and he's given me the opportunity to bring him on. He makes a little bit of money with me, and he learns from me, but he's getting his reps, right? And at some point, either he will become a bigger factor in my business, or he'll start his own business, and that's amazing, right? Um, rising tides lift all boats. So that's my goal. My goal isn't to make a million dollars and then that's it, go home. I want to make a million dollars, but I want to make a million dollars and raise the tide for people around me lo as local as possible first and then out from there. So my goal is to help other people. And then when it comes to clients of mine, people that I work with, people that I produce videos for, my goal is to create as much value for them. So if anybody here ever reaches out to me and goes, Mike, I really think I need a video, like Sonia just said to me, Mike, I need you to come over to my house and take my money. I need a video. I said, all right, hold on. I'm like, are we sure you even need a video? Like, as where somebody else would say, yeah, sure, how much you got? And then that'd be the end of the conversation. We took a very long time navigating, are we sure we need a video? Is this helping you get to the goal that you want to hit? Okay, what type of videos? What, what, where, what does that look like? So my goal with my business is very much in vain of who I named my company after, which is Seymour Mack. That's my grandfather, Dr. Seymour Mack Goldstein. He was a chiropractor for 67 years. He took patients till he was about 91 years old. He loved what he did. I saw him in his element growing up through my life. And the one thing, he was a very quiet person, but the one thing that he imparted on me and taught me was to care to care for the people that want to work with you, right? So his patients are the equation, like equate to my clients, right? So that's why I named the company after him. So when I am having these conversations and I say the name, I'm reminded of him and what he taught me, right? So it keeps me grounded. It keeps the moral set tight and it keeps the vision and the mission um, like very clear and focused. 
So all all due respect to that man because he really did help create who stands before you here today. Um, but we need to provide value. So I want to provide as much value for anybody that I work with. And again, I kind of started this by saying, like, you know, when charisma, you see her in these ele- in her element. It's very apparent when somebody is doing what they're supposed to be doing. And I do believe truly in my heart that charisma is doing what she's doing, because when you talk to her, she is genuinely very, very interested in your success and got helping guide you to get there. So um, I'll wrap up with that. And I just want to say thank you again to charisma. For Mr. Seymour, man. I mean, uh, Michael Brown, he got me confused. <laughs> Michael Brown, thank you. Give it up, give it up, give it up. Yo, we're matching. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Thank you. Oh, one more time. Oh, my goodness.